Hey, what's up everyone? Danny here. This is a gaming PC that I put together with the help of PNY and their Accelerate gaming brand. They're actually the sponsor of this video and they sent over the graphics card, the RAM, and the SSD to be used in this build. And alongside them, Fantex also helped out by sending over a few parts to be used in this build as well. So as a result, we've got a pretty sick build right here. <laughs> Uh, in this system is an RTX 3070, and this was actually my first time building with one, and I'm super grateful to be able to have a chance to check one out, because as we all know, the RTX 30 series has been really hard to get a hold of for almost everybody. The climate we're in with GPU shortages is really unfortunate, and initially it was due to the supply chain slowdowns for the pandemic, but then now we have a recent surge of cryptocurrency, and gamers have to compete with miners to try to get their hands on these graphics cards. I wanted to address this up front because I know the first thing people want to do when they see a video like this is rush to the comments and yell at me that these cards had a stock everywhere. I know, I'm well aware. I've also been hunting for these exact same parts to help friends and family with their builds, and I totally get it. I'm equally as frustrated that it's really hard to get, and I empathize with you. The best I could recommend is to have your alerts set on as many trackers as you can and join like those live streams that have the stock checkers that will notify you when a product comes back in stock. I personally had some luck doing this to pick up some higher demand parts. You just have to be persistent. But just like the GPU shortages during the first crypto boom in 2017 and the memory price hikes of 2018 and more recently the power supply markups of early 2020, this too will eventually pass. But while we wait for it to pass though, maybe you can get some inspiration from this video as you plan out your next build. All right, let's start off with the CPU. And for this build, I went with the recently released Ryzen 5 5600X. At $300, this is a really good CPU with six cores, 12 threads, and very solid IPC for both gaming and workload applications. I made a video comparing this to the Ryzen 7 3700X, which is another popular option in the same price bracket. When planning for this build though, I actually saw the 3700X increase back up to its original launch price of $330, despite being a generation old. Because of that, the 5600X was more compelling to me. It's the newer chip with the newer architecture and it cost 10% less, so I went for it. I was able to buy one on Newegg when it was back in stock because I had alerts set up like I was talking about earlier. To me, both are neck and neck performance wise, and I think most people will honestly be happy with either of them. It's just that this time around though, it worked out that I ended up with the 5600X. The CPU cooler used in this build is the Fantex Glacier 1, and this is their 280mm variant. Fantex is new to the AIO game, however, the Glacier 1 series was developed in partnership with Asatec, and they're the manufacturer of AIOs for lots of different brands you're familiar with. Uh, this one is using their latest Gen 7 pump design. Now, I generally stick with traditional air coolers mainly because of the lower cost, but this is going to be a higher priced build where an AIO is a bit easier to find space for in the budget. Aesthetically, I think the pump cover with the infinity mirror design looks freaking awesome, but looks aside, this also does a really great job at keeping the overclock CPU cool, which you'll see later in the benchmarks. The motherboard I went with for this build is the MSI B450 Tomahawk Max. The beauty of the AM4 platform is the highly flexible compatibility across the motherboard and CPU generations. I actually picked this up just to have on hand for any upcoming builds since it's a very solid board at a very reasonable price of $115 and I haven't found a use for it yet so I figured why not use it in this build. The only thing to keep in mind though is that B450 boards are PCIe Gen 3 so if you absolutely needed Gen 4 for whatever reason, you're going to want to go for B550. For me personally, and I'd argue for probably most people out there, Gen 3 is going to be perfectly viable with regards to the SSD and graphics card performance. But speaking of graphics card performance though, we've got the Accelerate Gaming Rebel Epic X RTX 3070 in this build. What a name. This is a 3-fan card sporting a beefy cooler and shroud coming in at 2.5 slots thick. Among the 3070s released, this one is positioned pretty close to the $500 price tag of the Founders Edition model at launch, carrying only a $40 premium over the reference. That's how much it should cost anyway. Shortages and tariffs are currently affecting that, and I'll discuss that later on in the video. Out of the box, this has identical base and boost clocks to the reference design, which is 1500 and 1727 MHz respectively, but it can easily hit over 2 GHz without much effort. You'll see it boosting that high later on in the benchmarks. 
Coolant's performance on this card is good. I found it ran relatively quiet while keeping between the mid 60s to low 70 degrees during gaming. And the fans didn't ramp up much higher than 40% speed with the stock fan curves, despite being overclocked. For memory, we've got 16 gigabytes of Accelerate Gaming Epic X RGB memory at 3200 MHz CL16. Performance wise, this is a pretty standard kit of memory, priced in line with a lot of other RGB memory kits out there. The design is sleek and simple. It's nothing over the top, which is my preference, and the RGB is compatible with pretty much every motherboard software out there. For the boot drive, this system will be using the 500GB Accelerate CS3030 M.2 NVMe SSD. This is a consumer level SSD that delivers good performance without breaking the bank, with up to 3500 megabytes per second read and 2000 megabytes per second write speeds. That's gonna be plenty fast for boot up times as well as overall quick and snappy user experience in Windows. It also has a DRAM cache for those of you out there who shun DRAMless SSDs. This particular drive is PCIe Gen 3, which works perfectly with our B450 motherboard, but PNY also has their Gen 4 CS3040 lineup for those of you out there going with a compatible motherboard. Paired with the boot drive is this 3TB 7200 RPM Seagate's Constellation 3.5 inch drive for mass storage of media files as well as lower priority games and programs. For the same price, you could go with a standalone 1TB SSD instead, but I think the versatility of having an SSD HDD combo is just as appealing since now we've got 3.5TB to work with. Powering the system is the Fantex Amp 650 watt 80 plus gold modular power supply. This is a highly regarded unit, finding itself at the A tier of the ever so popular PSU Cultist tier list, and it's received positive marks from the professional testers and reviewers over at Tom's Hardware and Kit Guru. Priced at $100 and backed with a 10 year warranty, this is a good investment worth paying for because the power supply is the one thing that's going to remain constant in your system for multiple upgrade cycles to come, whereas the rest of your system will likely be upgraded every few years. All this is going into the Fantex Eclipse P500A DRGB. This is a high airflow mid tower case equipped with three 140mm adjustable RGB fans in front and it's pretty feature packed. The tempered glass panel has a hinge design which makes partially opening the side very convenient while still being easy to completely remove when needed. For cable management, it's got a number of individual sliding panels to close off the multiple cable openings where you would typically route your cables, and the back is filled with straps and has plenty of depth to easily keep everything tidy. Overall, this case is designed so that you end up with a really clean and sleek looking build, which you'll see shortly here in the B-roll sequence. So the total cost of the system comes in just over $1,500 before tax. Now I know most people are going to look at this and say, wait a minute Danny, that MSRP of $540 for a 3070 isn't realistic. That doesn't take into account potential price increases due to tariffs. Don't worry, I thought ahead and I planned for this. Taking a look back at the summary, you may have noticed that the cooler in case is a bit more on the premium and therefore pricier side than usual. And that was done intentionally so that I could present some opportunities to shift money around while keeping the same total budget. This is how I've built in some flexibility to adjust for the tariffs. There are a lot of other options you can go with for a comparable case and CPU cooler. The Fantex P400A for example would be a great case to substitute in for $40 less. And going with an air cooler instead of an AIO could save quite a bit as well. If you do that, you've now got more money to put towards the 3070. It should be more than enough to account for the tariffs or any other price increases. The only issue now is that we just need them to be consistently in stock so you could actually buy them. Here's some glamour shots of the build. I think it cleans up real nice when all is said and done. Okay, so the build is looking good, but does it have the performance to back up the looks? Let's find out with some benchmarks. For the 5600X, I enabled Precision Boost Overdrive in the BIOS, which lets the system automatically determine how much to let it boost based on the power, current voltage, and the temperatures. And as a result of this, uh, what you'll see in the benchmarks is that the 5600X is often running up to 4.65 gigahertz on all cores. The 16 gigabytes of RAM is running its 3200 MHz XMP, and the Rebel Epic X 3070 is overclocked by 200 MHz on the core and 500 MHz on the memory. And the core clock ends up running at a steady like 2070 MHz most of the time. 
I tested a variety of things from workload related benchmarks uh, to games. And for the games, I tested at three resolutions, uh, 1080p, 1440p, and 4K. I also looked at streaming performance as well. Uh, so yeah, sit back, relax, and enjoy the benchmarks. This build pretty much crushes anything thrown in its way uh, at 1080 and 1440p and it also handles streaming really well. I made sure to stream the heaviest title in my benchmarking suite to make sure that the uh, system resources were the most utilized and as you saw both X264 and NVENC performed really well. If you want to use this build for 4K gaming however, you're going to have to be willing to drop below 60fps in the newer AAA titles like you saw in Assassin's Creed Valhalla and Cyberpunk. I'm not sure if you can really ask for more out of a $1,500 system. Uh, 4K is definitely still a luxury and it's a bit of a ways from becoming the standard. 1080p remains by far the most popular resolution with roughly 66% of all users reported in the Steam hardware survey. Second place is 1440p at nearly 10% and 4K makes up only like 2%. And while we're talking about resolution though, you may have noticed that I had DLSS turned on whenever I could during the benchmarks. If the title had it, then I turn it on. If you're unfamiliar with DLSS, it stands for Deep Learning Super Sampling, and it's exclusive to RTX graphics cards. Enabling it effectively runs the game at a lower resolution, which in turn gives you a noticeable performance increase, and then it uses AI to kind of smoothen out the would-be jagged edges uh, that lower resolutions usually give you, and it makes it pretty darn close to the native resolution. Here's an example from my testing of the performance differences. In Fortnite, when I was running in 4K, without DLSS, we're not getting much higher than 60 FPS. But with it enabled to the quality mode, which is the best looking one, the frame rate jumps to 90 FPS, and that's a 50% increase, which is huge. Now, the results may not always be this dramatic. How much it increases depends on a multitude of things, like what title you're playing, what resolution, and what graphics settings you're playing at. 
but in general, I found that it's always worth turning on for better frame rates. So I'm bringing this up because you may have also noticed that in the benchmarks, I didn't show anything with ray tracing turned on for any of the titles. And that's because if you're interested in playing games with ray tracing turned on for like that next level of immersion and hyper-realistic graphics, then you're gonna need DLSS. Here's Cyberpunk with ray tracing turned on without DLSS. We're averaging around 30 FPS. Turning on DLSS, however, saves the day and it gives a much more enjoyable experience at 60 FPS. And you can't really tell that it's on. Like I couldn't tell that it was running at a low resolution. Regardless of the title you're playing, if you're planning on enabling ray tracing, you better plan to enable DLSS alongside it. What I'm really curious about though, is what all of you out there are most interested in when it comes to these newer graphics cards. Are you looking at them for their newer features like ray tracing, DLSS, and reflex, which is something I couldn't even test for this video because I have no method of actually testing and showing the data. Um, or do you care only about the traditional rasterization performance? Be sure to let me know down in the comments below because that's something I would love to hear about and hear your thoughts on. Um, but with that said, that's gonna wrap it up for this video. I hope you all enjoyed and found it either useful or entertaining. And I wanna give a huge thanks to PNY and Fantex for helping make this build possible. Uh, I want to thank you all as well out there for continuing to watch and support the channel. It means a lot to me. And uh, Land Party Stories should be my next upload, so get ready for that. Uh, but yeah, take it easy, stay safe out there, and I look forward to catching you all down in the comments as well as in the next video. Bye.